the key challenge is uh, two fronts one is of course the logistics of it uh, like essentially how does one transport and process this biomass from the farm to an industry uh, the second aspect is uh, right no farmer would be interested in investing their time and money in uh, in participating in this in this value chain if there is no economically viable off tech market are listening to understanding the future podcast i am the host punit gandhi and this podcast is developed in association with climate center for cities under the national institute of urban affairs and the ministry of housing and urban affairs this is a podcast where we discuss about the future of work in the field of climate change urban development innovation and sustainability with the help of leaders and visionaries working on ground as well as in the top management of public and private sector Our objective is to better understand the future so that we can be prepared and intervene to enable climate actions in the urban areas. Hello everyone. This episode is being rebroadcasted. This podcast was originally recorded by me, your host Punit Gandhi, in June 2020, when I had just started recording the podcast independently under the title "Understanding Future." I hope you guys enjoy this podcast. Thank you. Hi, Vidyut, uh, and welcome to Understanding Future. We uh, good to have you over here on board for our episode on understanding future of biomass. So, with you, if you would, if you can just give a brief background about yourself to our audience, that would be great to start off with. Hi, Puneet. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, pleasure to be speaking with you. I, uh, the co-founder of Takachar. Uh, what we are trying to do through this company is uh, drastically scale the utilization of waste biomass. in the form of uh, agricultural residues to make various kinds of uh, products like solid fuel fertilizers uh, specialty chemicals and uh, we are trying to do this through technology hardware technology uh, uh, that essentially enables this to happen right and uh, we are also trying to build a marketplace that connects uh, farmers to uh, the end buyers of such products uh, leading to uh you know increase in farmer incomes through the sale of their crop residues uh, but also addressing the problem of open burning of crop residues which is uh, which has been contributing to pollution problems in uh, not only many parts of india but many parts other parts of the world as well that that sounds pretty interesting and i really like the idea and concept so you have said what takachar does and what it is planning to do and you guys basically sell something called it activated carbon so is this all solid fuel fertilizers and all part of activated carbon or how does that function yeah i mean that's something uh, activated carbon is uh, that's something we are starting with but the same equipment can be used for to make solid fuel and fertilizers okay. so biomass is very context dependent each biomass uh, it can be custom tailored to make specific kinds of products right so not all biomasses are suitable to make activated carbon for example okay. uh, so what we are trying to do with our equipment is uh, our equipment allows uh, all these different biomasses to be used to make these different products uh, obviously as a startup we cannot have our focus uh, everywhere so we are starting with activated carbon for now okay and so you guys have a hardware piece which helps in uh, processing specifically crop residues any specific type of crops or any kind of crops can be brought in that whole thing any kind of crop residues so we've tested with rice husk coconut shells you know uh, sugarcane bagasse uh, sugarcane trash wheat straw paddy straw so we i mean uh, various kinds of uh, crop residues that are usually based and are uh, generally of no value okay and so where can this activated carbon be used uh, because you are starting from there i would at least like to understand where where is the exact use case of this scenario uh, yeah so activated carbon is typically used in uh, purification of air and gas streams right uh, polluted air and gas streams so it's used in a water filter water purifiers at home okay. it's used to use used for industrial water purification it's used for municipal water purification Uh, companies like coca cola pepsi utilize that to purify their 
uh, water for the drinks they make. Then it's also used in air purifiers, it's used in power plants to remove mercury emissions. It's used in mining as well uh, for uh, purification of the extracts. So it has various it's a, a lot of uh, it has various applications uh, involving uh, removing out uh, impurities. Okay. And uh, specifically with air pollution, then I'll come to that point. Uh, how is it used in, like, can we use directly it in, uh, for masks and all, which are currently a lot in demand for sure? Yeah, so some, some, some masks do, do have activated carbon okay. in their uh, filters, but uh, a lot don't. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, so that, that is one application, but it's, it's, it's primarily... I mean, if you have to just remove uh, PM 2.5, PM 10, it's not really needed. Okay. But if to remove actual organic compounds like volatile matter or, you know, some, something something as dangerous as mercury emissions or something, and, you know, so then, then it's uh, very important to have it. Okay, okay. So but then I'm assuming it is not uh, also used a lot in air purifiers that ha- that are used in homes, especially in places like Delhi. In air purifiers, uh, it's uh, it's used actually in some uh, air purifiers, uh, but in masks, not that much. Okay. okay. Yeah. So that's quite interesting. And eventually, you plan to take these products further into solid fuel. Uh, and what will be the use of solid fuel? If you can just clarify on those lines. Yeah. So in the case of solid fuels, uh, what it does is obviously the process of making solid fuels from biomass is that established. Uh, what it does, uh, this process allows is it adds value to that solid fuel. It increases the calorific value of the fuel, right? Uh, so essentially, what that would do is it would, I mean, the produce, um, it would fetch a higher value in the market because of the calorific value. And uh, at the same time, it reduces the a lot of the logistics associate logistical costs associated with uh, the entire biomass value chain. Hmm. So if you are, if I mean, our equipment is small scale and decentralized. Okay. So if you're able to upgrade uh, this uh, biomass uh, close to the site itself where it's generated, so it makes it you know, dense carbon-rich material, that um, reduces the logistics cost of transporting uh, by up to 60%. Oh, wow. And uh, so that has a benefit uh, there as well. Okay. And then you can basically use that solid fuel to either for gas as well as for producing electricity, if I'm not. Yeah, so various thermal applications can be used in boilers, right, typically. So initially, if one has to start small, one would typically sell it to boilers, Hmm. smaller boilers. If you're able to scale well enough, then you can, of course, uh, supply to large thermal power plants. Like NTPC has come up with biomass uh, pellet policy. Okay. For, for white pellets uh, as well as for uh, bio coal. Okay. So that's, that's a potential business model I think you would explore in future once you have better market reach. Uh, right, yeah. Once you're able to achieve some scale. Okay, that's that's quite it. And the fertilizer, I'm assuming it directly, like, because it's uh, activated carbon or something, you can directly put it for plants and they'll get more carbon out of it or is it something else yeah uh, so that's a good question so with fertilizers uh, that's something that we are actually much closer to market than uh, say uh, with solid fuels okay uh, i mean what essentially uh, what we're trying to do is is to make a complete fertilizer product that has the uh, npk nutrients as well as the carbon that the soil needs in one package using uh, the output from our machine as a substrate and uh, what it has is uh, the potential to, uh, we're trying to see, I mean, a lot of it is still in the research phase. We're trying to see, you know, if we can reduce synthetic fertilizer usage, right, and surface runoffs versus uh, output from our product at, at the same time. So the surface runoffs are essentially, you know, go and pollute other water streams uh, once they run off from the field. So we're trying to see that. At the same time, we're trying to uh, see how it's uh, how it's affecting crop yields. Till now, we've done uh, pilots with a company in Kenya. Okay. And, uh, and the results, and we've worked with 3,500 farmers there, and the results have shown that uh, the product uh, we have developed together with that company in Kenya increases farm yield, uh, crop yields by uh, up to 25% versus synthetic fertilizers. The, the first year of application itself, or over years that this kind of uh, uh, productivity or efficiency in crop yield comes in? 
Yeah, so you begin to see gains uh, after uh, after a year. Okay. The results. Yeah. Wow, that's that's tremendous yield though, because uh, at least uh, if you can increase that much amount and around what would be the cost factor difference would you see in this kind of uh, chemical synthetic and this biofertilizers? Yeah, so it's said uh, it's so what I mean those are, that's something we're exploring right now exactly what we exactly how much we need to price it at. Okay. But the uh, I mean the partner company in Kenya that we work with uh, they sell it at the same price actually. Oh. As synthetic fertilizers. Okay, uh, that, that's also still fair enough. That uh, even at the same price, if you can get better efficiency, yeah, it makes much more sense for any farmer. And I'm I'm sure that that this helps uh, the soil as well nourish itself quite a lot in future. Over it has a lot of benefits. Uh, I mean, of course, this is some of the micro benefits that it has on a very large economic scale level. I mean, countries like India import a lot of uh, ammonia and phosphate from abroad. To make the fertilizers, I mean the, I mean the vision is to uh, locally produce fertilizers, uh, right? Um, at a, at a, say at a block level, or even uh, smaller than that. Yeah. And tailor it according to the uh, crops grown there, uh, according to the soil available, the climatic conditions, so that one is able to maximize the yield. So I, I can just like map a bit of it and I can imagine like, you know, do you have any idea of how much crop residue that is burned just out in the field every year in India? I mean, worldwide, if I can say it's it's about, I mean, in terms of monetary value, it's about $120 billion worth of crop residues that's just burned wow. worldwide. Wow. And if you just use a product like yours, you can actually convert it and make money out of it. Yes, yes. It's easier said than done. <laughs> but Actually, uh, I, I'm sure like yeah, yeah. So, but uh, I mean, that's the vision that uh, uh, equipment is deployed uh, with pharma groups, and uh, it is converted to a form that has value in industry, and then the industry buys that as a raw material to make various products, okay. like fuel, fertilizers, activated carbon. Okay, okay. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting. Specifically, how big this industry was, I have never realized. So apart from crop residue as well, what are the kind of other biomass products that you can use to make such activated carbon then not? So apart from for crop residue, what is uh, being used right now is fossil-based sources. Okay. Essentially, coal is currently used to make activated carbon and uh, wood is being used. So, uh, yeah, I mean, those are the only sources currently being used to make activated carbon. Uh, the biomass that is currently being used to make activated carbon is coconut shells. Okay. Okay, so uh, then I'm assuming that product would only be there in South Focused area where there are more plantations over there. Right, so con- Southern India, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, I mean essentially where there's a lot of coconut yeah. production. Okay, okay, fair. And especially when we talk about such things as well, it becomes uh, from a business point of view very important to look into the aspect of trans uh, aspect of uh, transportation and logistic because you don't want all the less the travel it has the better more green the product is as well as the cost are low. Right. right. Yeah, we want to avoid that. I mean, the entire idea behind this is uh, I mean, till now a lot of, a lot of biomass development is very large scale centralized units. Uh, you know that have essentially have to haul large volumes of biomass. Right. Essentially, you're hauling a lot of water. In the, which you want to avoid doing and uh, so the idea is to convert the biomass close to the site where it is ideally convert it to the end product there itself but if not possible convert it to the end product uh, via an industry that is uh, nearby okay so something like of uh, something like a decentralized centralized model so make sure that the cost efficiency can come. Right. Uh, with the fertilizer, uh, we're actually, uh, we have, uh, at least in the pilot still up, we have managed to achieve a complete decentralized production. Okay. So at the village level itself, it is the, the crop residues are converted into the fertilizer and then sold in the, uh, to farmers uh, in and around the village itself, closing the loop. That That's quite interesting because in that case scenario, like, I think that would be quite cheap for them as well as uh, the whole execution process and it also leads to especially the community building aspect of uh, the farming as well because everyone knows where the source and the product is coming from, how it is made and everything on those lines, right? Yeah, I mean, that does play a part in uh, building some trust, uh, definitely. 
but uh, i mean farmers are still you know uh, i mean they don't want to uh, take a risk in you know changing what they have been doing for a very long time what has worked from the, what has worked for them essentially hmm. uh, with say you know traditional fertilizers that they have been using yeah so it does it it, it does take some amount of uh, show and tell to uh, get them involved but but yeah i mean producing locally and seeing seeing what happens definitely plays a part it's not it's not a completely alien process to them okay so but how do you how do you get on board this farmer if they do not want to change because that becomes a very interesting uh, view point for at least us to understand how do farmers think and what do they do how do they proceed on their life Yeah so we essentially started with some uh, wealthy farmers that were growing some horticultural crops that had some plantations okay right uh, so uh, they were they were much easier to convince in, in using this and uh, once we managed to scale with them uh, that became a point of demonstration for a lot of the other farmers yeah and uh, so once a few paddy farmers got convinced with that they started uh, exploring the product Initially, we also did things like we, you know, we, we, uh, I mean, I mean, we gave the fertilizers to for uh, <clears throat> to them for free, very initially, yeah, for them to try out and check how the yield was. Yeah. Uh, so the initial first year was not very easy in scaling up, but after that, they saw that the, you know, the yield was not really going down, or you know, and it was essentially uh, either remaining the same or increasing uh, by up to twenty five percent in a lot of the cases. So I mean, after that, it was easy to spread by word of mouth okay. to other farmers. Okay. Uh, and then, how do you see this thing coming in India now? Because uh, this is Kenya's perspective. And, uh, as you know. Yeah. Uh, just to the previous point, I also uh, want to add that it was uh, it's important that the village production is done by a farmer himself or herself, right? Yeah. Uh, so if it's done by that then it just becomes a much uh, much easier to scale through the village so and is it nah. possible actually uh, to make it self sustainable that okay this is the amount of crop residue that comes out from their village itself can be made into fertilizer which they can use yeah so the, i mean the uh, company that we work with in kenya on the field it's called safi organics the founder is essentially I mean, uh, they have a, a production unit in the village. I mean, it's I mean that's their village. So uh, they they produce their product, right? Obviously, they utilize it in their own farm, yeah. and of course, they know the people around. So you know, just uh, that that uh, trust level just uh, goes up. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, that plays a very important part. Rather than you know someone coming from a city and selling a fertilizer to them, that's not going to work. Yeah, uh, but that's always the case with decentralized part, uh, right? Yeah. That local trust is one of the major factors in promotion of any product. Otherwise, uh, anyone comes from outside, they will not be able to penetrate it un- for a very long time. Yeah, I would definitely say that, right? Uh, uh, if the product adds a lot, lot of value and uh, yeah. to to the farmer, right? But even if it's more expensive than the current system, the farmer will buy it. on the basis of some level of uh, trust the uh, factor from someone else who used who has used it even if the product is more expensive okay so, yeah that's uh, that's quite interesting so yeah coming back to the indian point of view how do you see this things being developed in india now well uh, to develop this in india i mean it has to be similarly done right yeah. so we are looking to partner with uh, groups on the ground companies on the ground that are collecting uh, crop residues on a large scale and producing some products okay. out of it and uh, we'd be interested to partner with them to see if our equipment can add value to any of their uh, product streams so essentially i mean we're looking for people who uh, companies who have field presence on the ground yeah. and our technology can be used there to you know add more, uh, add our for the value to the crop residues or add a parallel stream of products that can be made yeah uh, it depends on the context whether that can be fuels fertilizers activated carbon or anything else okay uh, but the fertilizers for example right uh, if we say uh, you know just uh, uh, work with a company that's collecting crop residues say in punjab yeah that has access to paddy straw and rice husk uh, then it's a matter of our equipment being there and experimenting a way to uh, develop this fertilizer mix uh, can work for the case of punjab for example so that's the other thing right uh, i mean this this company in kenya managed to 
make this proprietary mix you know uh, which uh, which is act- which is actually the fertilizer mix uh, yeah. which of course is uh, uh, their ip and it's not open source so you know i mean you know, that's something that cannot be replicated directly in india unless safi organics uh, wants to do it yeah but it has to be uh, indigenously developed so the it will rem- involve some amount of r and d as well uh, along with the field partnership okay that that sounds like a, at least quite thought through plan and i hope you guys can achieve it as well on those lines so coming to one of the important questions of this whole thing about understanding future where do you see this uh, biomass this is not only energy this is utilization of biomass in different forms so that you can save energy uh i feel that's more apt for it than just to uh, understand the future of uh, for biomass energy so uh, in that sense where do you see this whole uh, biomass industry scaling up in future like i'm talking about at least 20 25 years down the line in the ideal case scenario that you would like to see right uh Yeah, so biomass. Uh, uh, one thing I can assure you, assure you, there's plenty of biomass in this world. There's no shortage of waste biomass that can be <clears throat> can be can be utilized, right? So availability of biomass is not a problem. The key challenge is uh, two fronts. One is, of course, the logistics of it. Uh, essentially, how does one transport and process this biomass from the farm to an industry? Yeah. Right? It is very loose, bulky, and wet. You know, so that makes that entire uh, entire process very challenging. uh the second aspect is uh, right no farmer would be interested in investing their time and money in uh, in participating in this in this value chain if there is no economically viable off tech market for the biomass so uh, those two have to be there the the second the second part is a question of the um, is a question a lot, question of r&d actually yeah uh, right a lot of r&d needs to go in in uh, if you got various bio, uh, various markets for biomass right so anything that is fossil based right now uh, for example uh, graphite uh, graphene carbon black activated carbon uh, fertilizers fuels uh, all of these can be uh, explored and see how biomass can uh, replace uh, production of these things right uh, so of course that is a question of r&d and uh, uh, scaling up over time so one is never going to see a very like you know steep exponential scaling up like you know we see in traditional vc funded startups it is very r and d dependent and it's going to be slow and steady growth it's going to take 10 15 years for this to achieve some sort of scale and the second thing is uh, of this entire question of logistics and uh, conversion of the biomass i mean this this can only happen if you have some sort of decentralized processing processing i mean the traditional approach has been very centralized and a large scale which is not going to work right this has existed for the past uh, uh, many decades and it has shown that despite biomass not being available in plenty it has not been able to scale there is uh, the industry is not being able to achieve its full potential so one has to develop technologies that process this biomass at a decentralized level close to where they are generated so these are the two things that uh, i see are key to key for this industry to scale uh, yeah. from our own perspective uh, we are trying to uh, have about uh, 250 systems on the ground by the beginning of 2024 uh, so that's what our target is yeah and uh, yeah I me mean, that's what our energies are going towards in achieving that okay so uh, then do you guys have this is this is quite an interesting insight as well on the whole uh, biomass and what are the challenges and what your goals are as well so if if you can share a bit of more details on the lines of uh, where uh, so if you are planning to sell 250 of such systems by 2024 that includes the whole a uh, supply chain of manufacturing that you have to develop i think a whole marketplace that you need to develop and uh, to make sure that people are on board as well uh, so what all other things and challenges do you see in scaling up to this level right so uh, first challenge is of course uh, the entire marketplace development right uh, so we have deliberately chosen activated carbon because uh, uh, it is some it is it is a value chain that already uses uh, biomass and so well established value chain uh, so we are 
kind of uh, hooking on to that to start with. Okay. And uh, that would involve essentially focusing a lot on the product that we're making. So right now our, uh, our, our goal is to first, you know, focus on the product and then uh, and uh, not worry about setting up all this field value chain and all the operations part of it. Okay. So essentially, we want to part. Uh, we want to focus uh, target a value chain that's already well established. Oh, okay. And a biomass as well. And uh, uh, so and other some other challenges in India include like for a startup, right? Manufacturing is a big challenge. Yeah. If uh, essentially for something that has a more slower and uh, steadier growth, if you have to make say you know, I mean, uh, finding a fabrication and manufacturing partner in the beginning is very difficult task. Uh, so that's what my experience is. So initially, one when you're prototyping, for example, right, no big manufacturer would uh, would be interested to partner with you. Uh, even if they do, uh, they will they, they might show interest in the beginning. Okay. Uh, but as soon as uh, they get a big order from some other company, right, that requires a very large system to be made, or say hundreds of systems to be made in a month, yeah, uh, your your project will get sidelined and it'll, it'll get delayed. And that's what that has been one of our experience for the past uh, manufacturer. Uh, but at the same time, if you go to a very small manufacturer, I mean, <clears throat> you'll see the quality of the product is not that really great. Quality yeah. of the manufacturing and the fabrication. Yeah. So there's a big missing gap in between. Uh, that's something that can cater to small businesses, uh, right? That can manufacturers that can uh, cater to selling say five to ten systems in a month. Initially, when the startup startup is small. Yeah. Or even earlier, right, when the startup is just prototyping. Yeah. Uh, so that's a big challenge. Uh, there are people available who do that, but it's just, it's a very hard task to find out. And uh, we burnt our hands a lot in the beginning while doing this. Okay. So uh, that's that's basically an opportunity for a lot of people out there that manufacturing space for new and upcoming startups is empty. I see it as that point of view over here that, uh, yes, it's a very difficult process because of scaling and everything. But if someone is in that field uh, of manufacturing and can potentially utilize it to scale it up in a different direction as well, this might be an interesting opportunity. Uh, yes, it would definitely save a lot of our time. I, mean, I, I think I would have saved a lot of my... Hassle, right? Doing a lot of uh, doing a lot of running around work and uh, uh, getting getting things fabricated. It's actually quite a <laughs> operationally intensive and difficult task when, when you have a very small team and one has to work with really small fabricators. Yeah. And ensuring things are done properly. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'll I'll surely say it out loud that uh, if anyone does it and is listening to this, please reach out to me or with you, then we will. I'll connect you to him as well, if required. Uh, awesome. <laughs> so uh, that's quite interesting uh, thought process. And you have already shown where you guys are headed as well. So what all other things do you expect, at least on the job front, that what kind of R&D are we looking at? What kind of resources that needs to go into this so that such fields can come out as a winner as well? And yeah. where do you see this going? Yeah, that's a good question, Puneet. Uh, one thing I would definitely say, I mean, one uh, if one has to uh, generate a lot of hardware innovations in India that have a very long uh, development cycle, right? Yeah. And uh, and they take money in the beginning to do all the R and D. So currently, uh, from uh, uh, so I would like to say that I mean this can be done only through uh, if it, only through grants, and it should be done only through grants in the beginning. Okay. Right. Uh, so I uh, and it should be done specifically through government grants uh, and uh, research institutions, uh, government uh, research institutions or private research institutions in India. Okay. The thing is, a uh, lot of the government grants currently available in India for uh, developing technologies hmm. are uh, can actually lead to can contribute to only development of uh, a technology that is already reached a certain level of. Uh, technology readiness level, right? If it's above yeah. close to TRL 5 or, you know, somewhere for... Okay. That's you know, already that, quite high. So you are not really innovating, but you are just strengthening the innovated product. Yeah, you're, you're essentially just uh, uh, doing some engi- uh, just doing the engineering of it, yeah. right? 
but uh, if one has to really go down into the scientific r and d you know really really low to trl work and one has to uh, do it uh, outside the university ecosystem one can still be associated with facilities at a university yeah. but one is not really student there right so uh, uh, that i mean for that one has to really uh, need the more amount of funds uh, obviously uh, more amount of grants available from the government side yeah for these to happen the biotechnology ignition grant and uh, the actually is a very good uh, grant for this to happen but uh, this is actually a bit uh, i mean it's i would say it's it, i mean the the quantum of funds need to be increased i mean for us to do this r&d it has i mean for uh, for our work it has taken the one phd project one master thesis right me and my co-founders <laughs> yeah and after that uh, three more years after that yeah <laughs> so uh, it uh, and this is combining uh, funds available in us and india yeah uh, so uh, i i would definitely say that uh, that needs to happen uh, right so this local ecosystem in india to support scientific r and d innovations and hardware not uh, not just uh, anything to do with you know uh, computer software generated computer software or you know i would even go uh, ahead and say with to to with, with ai or machine learning right yeah. those typically have uh, low i guess uh, they, i mean the product can be developed much faster I mean, if one has to go into core scientific R and D, I mean, speaking in terms of energy technology, right? I mean, one has to think of say how how do we uh, uh, just randomly uh, talking about uh, things like how do we uh, use solar thermal to make cement uh, to provide energy for making cement, yeah. or you know, uh, or carbon capture or storage, for example, right? All these things require a very low TR TRL level of scientific innovation, and that requires a lot of money. True. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, just uh, looking at the system in the US is something that you know that can be actually copied, right? One doesn't have to like really innovate on that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the government grant system there is, uh, I mean, that has its own bureaucratic uh, problems and challenges. But it, there's a system there that is established that rewards uh, competitive uh, companies to uh, get grants, uh, right? Sometimes even up to multiple millions of dollars, right? and uh, develop the product yeah and uh, so that's something that definitely needs to develop in india we are still i mean our economy is still not as i guess uh, um, big as the us so uh, a lot of the chunk of the funds like is hard to utilize for such uh, things yeah uh, but uh, as our economy grows a uh, uh, percentage of that substantial percentage of that should be utilized to develop this ecosystem yeah absolutely that sounds uh, that sounds very uh true as well because i have been working on the field of innovation as well and we were looking at the data where india hardly spends around the 0.7 or 1.7 something on those lines for their r&d and uh, r&d also basically looks into improving efficiency of uh, your existing systems so uh, that does not really mean that it is going directly into development of product as well and that is something which is quite surprising but fair enough as well from the economic standpoint i hope uh, we can improve upon that aspect for better technology development and hopefully better make in india startups like yours right all right and with the current funding ecosystem right i mean one has to get money uh, the large amounts of money then i mean essentially it's private equity at the moment and yeah. i mean it, i don't think it makes sense to get a, a dilutive funding uh, when i mean you've not developed a product and you've not really you know uh, proven your market not does it make sense to take loans obviously so i mean this just leaves grants uh, you know for you know for you to develop your technology and the only way it can happen is by the government developing an ecosystem to do that and choosing a very competitive startups as recipients of those grants yeah because you will also need uh, those technologies to be understood by academicians as well as industrialists uh, so you need a good ecosystem on the background to actually vet such startup as well so that their product can be developed uh, at the initial phase and not at trl five for more of that more right okay uh, that that's a very interesting piece in point uh, from you i guess so uh, that says a lot that uh, effort that you have made and the years of work that you have done on ground i have seen uh, you do it as well so i think i can say that uh, uh, i hope you guys 
succeed as soon as possible on those lines as well in India and uh, make it big uh, in the biomass sector. Anything else that you would like to add uh, to this whole discussion? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, nothing much more. I mean, I, I'm just, I mean, I, I get very intrigued and curious about this entire ecosystem for uh, scientific innovation and commercialization. Yeah. Uh, because I've uh, a first-hand uh, account of seeing how it, uh, how the ecosystem is in the U.S. Uh, and how it is in India. Yeah. India is slowly moving towards that direction, but if we need to, but we need to uh, move faster now in setting up that ecosystem and. Uh, you know, there are a lot of aspects of it. I don't know if you have enough time for yeah. me to talk about it, but it essentially starts with uh, uh, innovators in the university level, right? PhDs or uh, master level students or even undergraduate students who have an innovation. Uh, uh, the approach is to not putting the hammer to a nail, right? Not yeah. going with an innovation and then figuring out the problem that it's going to solve. Yeah. One has to start with the customer discovery process uh, right in the beginning. Yeah, uh, and then develop the product accordingly. So that's what the uh, innovation ecosystem in the U.S. starts with something called uh, uh, the ICOPS program from the National Science Foundation, and that gives a grant uh, for selected uh, students to try to understand a market pain point. And once you get that grant, uh, if you pass that program, then you get a grant to develop a prototype based on the pain points that you've learned. Once you develop that prototype, then you get uh, eligible to participate in large government grants, you know, from like SBIR yeah. uh, in, the, in the U.S. So, I mean, there, there's a stage for every, uh, I mean, for every step. And uh, I, I think if, I, if that develops in India, I mean, I would, uh, that's something that could, you know, really let and lead to be IP generated being within India. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's that's a very good insight as well for us to how to actually get into this whole process of development of its own uh, uh, research and development and generating more IPs because India severely lacks on those terms as well, uh, which is something uh, I'm not sure. How, uh, we are trying to focus on it for sure or uh, as a country, but I'm not sure how f- productive that focus has been. Uh, so I will not comment on it a lot, but yeah, we really need to make sure that uh, more and more IPs are generated, more and more papers are published in India to make uh, to make India a more innovative country. But thank you, thanks a lot, Vidyut. Uh, I'm I'm really happy that uh, I could speak to you on this, uh, with, like with so much amount of good content coming from types of biomass products that comes into place to understanding the ecosystem of uh, farmers and uh, decentralized fertilizers that can be used and activated carbon as well and then eventually turning into the whole ecosystem aspect of how funding is important for such uh, startups and hopefully we can bring in more and more funding on these lines and try to develop more and more R&D in India. Thanks a lot for doing an episode with me. Uh, Pleasure, pleasure Puneet. You have been listening to Understanding the Future podcast. To know more about Climate Center for Cities, visit us at www.c-q.niua.org and follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter and Instagram. The show is conceptualized, hosted and produced by Punit Gandhi. You can listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and Spotify. So don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends and colleagues. Thank you and stay tuned for the next episode.